everyone. Hello. Welcome back for the last um, panel of today's uh, session. Thank you so much for joining us again. Hope you enjoyed the break. Again, I think these things are so important to, to look for the networking as much as anything else. But we've got an absolutely fine, fantastic panel joining us uh, for our last session of the day. Um, and it's basically just to, get, uh, to, to really bring together some of the themes that we've had uh, through the, 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 uh, the breakout sessions and from, this morning, uh, from the, the first session as well. Um, and, and, and really, I just want to kick off um, partly to let the, 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 the members who haven't spoken before to introduce themselves to some degree, to say hello. Uh, I want to ask all four uh, panelists just to give a, us a bit of a summary, really, for themselves, a bit of a sense of what they've learned, what they've heard so far from talking to people in the room, talking to, listening to the, 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 the talks we've had so far. Um, and then just give me a sense of, really, I guess the, the key thing is, you know, why do we need this? What, what, it, what, what are we doing here? And why, why does business want this at the moment? That would be really good to have an answer to as well. So um, where should we start? Well, I mean, uh, Lord, Lord Shingwin, uh, starting at the end and move, moving towards me, just give us a sense of, again, just give us a re reflection of what you've heard so far and, and what, what, what you think is important about today. So first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of this. And um, I hope for being part of something big. Um, I think that the IOD, to its great credit, has, has fought big, has uh, been challenged, and is challenging us uh, to think big and to act. It confirms my initial belief that business is a force for good. As I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, I don't think change would be happening uh, without business. So it's so encouraging. All the conversations I've had today, people have been so kind in saying um, that they're really finding this worthwhile, valuable. And I think to go back to your point, Dan, yeah, as to why now, why is this right for business? I think the point that, um, that the Director General opened with which is that um, we can't afford n not to do this, um, that we've got very uh, low unemployment, certainly at the moment. We have a job shortage, we have, uh, or, or rather a still shortage, and we, we need to, um, to harness these, or this diverse talent uh, among the protected characteristic groups particularly. Um, that were covered uh, by the Commission's work. So um, I'm once again left with a sense of an appetite for change. Um, and and I'm, I'm interested to hear what the other panellists think in terms of whether that's also the sense that they're getting, and, and yourself, Dan. Uh, uh, well, sorry, Virginia, can we, can we just go to you, uh, uh, just, to, just to give a... First of all, introduce us to, to, to DAC Beechcroft what you guys are up to in terms of this area. Uh, we heard from, uh, from, uh, from the, the law fraternity, or fraternity, or law community, I should say, earlier uh, about this area. And uh, it would be great to know about what, what you guys are doing and in terms of what mm. are the kind of main push points for, for your organisation. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'm delighted to be here. In fact, when Lord Shrinkwin rang me more than six months ago now and asked me whether I wanted to be a part of his commission, uh, there was absolutely no hesitation in my mind. It's uh, been a huge privilege to serve uh, on that commission. And I think, judging by the number of us that are in the room, there is uh, huge energy to support this change. Um, for me, um, what I have, have heard from conversations today is about the energy uh, that there is for change. It's uh, absolutely an imperative for us all um, and for all leaders uh, in the room. Um, what have we been doing at DAC Beechcroft? Well, quite a lot. Um, have we been entirely successful all the time? No, um, but we keep trying. Um, I liken it a bit to gardening. Um, you know, working on culture is just something you have to keep doing again and again and again. Um, we were very clear at the outset that we wanted to understand our culture uh, and understand what it was. So probably mm, seven years ago now when I came into my role as senior partner, uh, we set about asking the people who lived our culture, 
which was our colleagues. And we went out into the business. We created safe spaces for them. Uh, I led it, but I wasn't in the room. I came away so they could be honest and open, and they were. So we knew what we were starting with. Um, and if, if culture, and we've heard such an enormous amount about that today, if culture matters, go out and find out what it is. If there's just one tip I would give as a leader, um, go out, well, I'll give you two. Uh, one, go out and find out what it is. And then two, live and breathe it every single day. Well, that do for now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, tell me, let's dive into that slightly just before I move on. Uh, because uh, law firms, I think, are, uh, are that, you know, have been very good at uh, making clear plans and trying to push them mm -hmm. through. But I hear from so many lawyers, long hours, mm -hmm. so difficult to get through partners if it's a partnership. You know, you have, uh, you know, people, you know, I was, I was talking to uh, one of my friends who's a, a female lawyer and a, a, a managing partner who was saying she's having to force her male lawyers to go on paternity leave mm -hmm. because they won't do it otherwise. They won't do it. They want to be hot shot lawyers. They want to be top of the, top of the, the heap. And that, those, that sort of culture is so difficult to change, isn't it? Yeah. And how do you go about that? Well, it is tough. Um, my colleagues might disagree, but... Um, we, we don't have a hugely long hours culture in our firm. Mm. We never have had. Um, and we're very respectful of the balance that people need to have. I talk about people being able to bring their whole selves to work. I firmly believe that. We, we live and work. We have families, caring responsibilities, whatever it is. We all have outside of work lives, I would hope. Um, so you're, you're right, the law um, is renowned for long hours culture. We don't particularly have that at DAC Beechcroft. There are peaks and troughs uh, in that. But how do we get our men to take paternity leave? Well, we encourage them and they feel safe in coming back that their cases won't have been nicked by others mm -hmm. and uh, that they will have a role when they come back. Um, and our women demonstrate success in coming back from their maternity leave, which I would hope then gives our men the courage to take that paternity leave. So I think our women are the trailblazers in terms of helping a whole family. It's a whole family environment, isn't it? It's not just about sort of men taking a bit of paternity leave and women taking their maternity leave. It's about how share, shared caring responsibilities are supported yeah. by a firm. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, it's just a particular case. So I, I remember thinking that you were just highlighting to me just one of those examples of not just law, but uh, lots of professions, how difficult it is to uh, necessarily uh, walk the walk sometimes as well as talk it. Mm -hmm. But Theresa, tell us about Enable. Introduce yourself and uh, give so us a sense I'm of it. I'm Theresa Shearer. I'm the Chief Executive of Enable. Um, I'm probably just going to ask you one quick question, which is to put your hands up if you've heard of Enable, and I won't be offended if you haven't. Oh, good. Oh, actually, more than I thought, so that's great. So um, let me tell you a little bit about us. We do three key things. We're a human rights-based, not-for-profit organisation. We're currently based in Scotland. However, I do have to say we're being tempted to come further south, and I can talk a bit about why that is. Um, the thing that surprises most people about Enable probably is our size and scale. So if you think about Scotland being 10% of the population of the rest of the UK, our income levels are 65 million and we employ just under 3,000 people. So by the IOD standards, a fairly um, substantial organisation. More importantly, we're a high-performing organisation. So in terms of health and social care and employability, which are two of our key pillars, we are amongst the highest performing across the private, public and not-for-profit sector in the whole of the UK. And actually, we benchmark very highly across the rest of Europe. So we're an organisation that was founded on human rights, that was founded on equality, but actually we've become a fairly sizable business in the sense of our turnover, the number of people we employ, and the number of customers or people we support. So we currently support about 6,500 people in terms of health and social care. And our second pillar is around employability and training and getting those people who to use a term that we don't use, further removed from the labour market into work. So if I think about that particular pillar and why that's important to the IOD and particularly to ED&I, 
For 20 years now, we've been supporting organisations like Scottish Power, Diageo, STVPLC, um, many, many SMEs to think about ed &I from a learning disability perspective and from a general disability perspective. We're now being asked to do more and more of that work across all of the protected characteristics. But the thing that is very different about us, I think, which is important and, and maybe a, a bit challenging to some of the things we've heard today, we're very focused on the individual's assets. So not employing somebody because they are not likely to leave or not employing somebody because they're not likely to ask for a pay rise or not employing somebody because they turn up for work every day. That's not the foundation of ED&I. Actually, the foundation of EDI and i is looking at the assets of every individual and particularly our young people. One of the things I was quite thoughtful in some of the comments I've heard today, which I think we should talk about, is segregation. So we're talking about EDI and i from an inclusion perspective and how we bring people together. One of the things that Enable is very strong in terms of our campaigning and advocacy and policy work is talking about ending segregation. Now, I've heard a number of people quoted today, not least Martin Luther King, about ending segregation, but actually in our society, we still have quite a bit of segregation. And until we fix that part of it, which is a policy and government issue, then we're not going to have better, more successful businesses. Now, what do I mean by that? If I can give you one example, in Scotland, for the past 20 years, we have had mainstream schools for young people with learning disabilities and additional support needs. Now, that is the right thing to do, not just from a moral perspective and imperative, but if we look at the PISA tables across Europe in terms of what happens with learning outcomes, then young people, irrespective of their disability, their socioeconomic background, their ethnic diversity, or their disability, are much more likely to perform better if they have attended an inclusive school. So if we can start to get things right from a policy perspective, I think we've got a much better chance of changing the business world. And I think, although you haven't said it, Lord Shinkwin, that might be why you asked me to be part of the commission. Mm. So it's to think about how do we improve businesses by not just improving the business themselves, but by improving society. And that means the public sector, the not-for-profit sector, as well as the private sector. Mm. And I'll just leave you with one stat in terms of the not-for-profit sector and why we're so involved with the Institute of Directors. Um, Andy Haldane, who's one of the key um, economists, or was one of the key economists at the Bank of England, and now Chief Executive of the RSA, has done some work on this, and about 10% of the GDP of our economy is linked to the not-for-profit sector. We employ a million people, and so if we're not getting it right in our sector, where we are founded on purpose, not as a tagline, not about ESG, but actually fundamentally about our charitable purposes. If we're not getting it right, and if you're not learning from us, then I actually think we've got a much steeper hill to climb. Mm. So I'm hopeful that we can share some of that learning with the business sector and move forward together as a cohesive sector. Mm. So I'll take you up on that challenge. Though. So what, what should businesses learn from you? What should businesses learn from the non-profit? charity sector. Okay, so things that we're good at, and the data tells you this, it's not just me, there's been some really interesting data from the David Hume Institute recently, which looked at gender balance on boards. So there's lots of great work that's been done in terms of balanced boards, in terms of gender. However, if you look at the FTSE and then compare it to the charity sector, and I'm talking about large charities like mine, who are comparable to medium or large businesses, then actually we are much more successful at having women on our boards women in our top executive teams and actually much more successful at having people with disabilities. We still have a way to go in terms of ethnic diversity and I think that's something that's true for all sectors but absolutely look at us, learn from us, come and talk to us about how we have progressed these issues over the past 20 years because actually we're a little bit further forward in many, many situations and we are more than happy to share that learning. Um, that is probably why, if you think about our charity just now and the work we do, we have such excellent corporate partners. So there's a reason that EY want to partner with us. There's a reason that Scottish Power want to partner with us. There's a reason that Diageo want to partner with us. It's because we're very good at this. We've been doing it for decades and we do have some learning. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to, again, uh, um, 
to, to start from uh, from the beginning. And I mean, just give us a sense of what we've heard here on stage, or what you've heard throughout this, the session or, or this afternoon, and indeed in the commission meetings that you've had to date. I mean, what are the what are your key kind of takeaways? Well, I think firstly, I, I wasn't I wasn't actually in the commission. We uh, we had a sorry, a number of people. No, no, that's not. Um, that was a good place to be, actually, because I could look at it from outside. <laughs> um, but this is, this is something that is, um, you know, it's from the IOD, it's from the top of the IOD, it's not just from me, but it's from the board as a whole. We, we believe that without talking about these things, without the learnings being shared, then you don't get any progress. And Lord Shinkham, you were saying earlier that, you know, maybe the government is sort of, I would say, digging itself into a hole of, of inaction. Mm. Um, that's where I think business can step forward. You know, I think we can challenge government. I mean, we happen to do that because we're the institute. Um, so we have a slightly unique position in that regard. Um, so I, to go back to the point of I heard, I think I've heard openness. I think you're just hearing people talk, openness and kind of an attitude. I talked about attitude before as being really important in terms of, uh, of how business can bring, bring things to bear. I think there's an attitude in the room, a kind of smell of the place, that is people want to do stuff. The challenge is what? What are you going to do? And often, you know, we'll hear from the speakers on the stage and from the speakers around the rooms that how they've done it. And often we look at that, and I include myself in the setting, you think, well, gosh, that's a hell of a journey. That, that's 20 years, that's 15 years, that's seven years. That's, actually, if you don't start, and, you know, we've been on this journey, if you don't start, you don't go, you don't go anywhere. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, the Institute was set up to do, you know, at its inception, uh, you know, our entire purpose to is improve the quality of directors and their equivalents in the UK. That's what we're here to do. And, and how do we do that? That's about really focusing on supporting directors to be the best directors we can be in everything we do. And that means we have a responsibility as the owners or the, the, the drivers or the leadership, the leaders of business, to be the leaders that the business needs us to be. And right now, and not just right now, it's been the case for decades, um, particularly in the light of the, uh, the, the skills talent uh, gap that we have, um, it's an absolute imperative that business needs to step forward. And if we can do a small thing by having this and continuing the conversations, then we'll have done part of our job. And we'll do it unto ourselves, but sometimes it looks quite difficult from outside. So I think having the learnings and go, oh, yeah, I could, I could do that. There's something I can take away. So what I would challenge people to do is, what are you going to do differently? Mm. Or what extra learning can you offer to others? Um, because the more we talk, the more we share, the better the chances are of being successful. Yeah. Yeah. Could I perhaps make just a slight challenge, if that's okay, from, from my perspective? Um, we've all been involved in COVID and we've all been involved in the pandemic, and one of the things we've learned from that is that social care is not the solution to the NHS problem. Social care is something that's really important and good in its own right. I think the same could be said of EDI. EDI is not the solution to the labour market problem. This is the right thing to do. A consequence will be the positives that come from the labour market. However, we have a huge journey in terms of productivity. And I think the prism that we should be looking at is not just plugging labour market shortfalls, but actually raising productivity as three connected sectors and not thinking about, as I've said, EDI being simply the solution to that particular problem. Yeah, I really do hope productivity comes back into the, to the mainstream conversation among our politicians quite soon, because it's such, a, such an important thing for this country. Um, I mean, one of the, uh, Jonathan, before I move on, I'm, actually, I should say, I, I, I really, I'm going to come to the audience next, and please start thinking some questions, because the point about inclusion, we would love to have this conversation as opposed to, a, to talking at you, so please do talk to us as well, and I'll come to you next. But Jonathan, um, just, to, just, just to, to, to the point, Around again, companies' best practice, and you've and you've got trailblazers, and you'll be. It, it seems to me that there's often the problem within within British business and, and, and industry is that you'll have you'll have the companies that we see, and they they talk about the good stuff they're doing, and that there is good stuff, and they are doing the right things. And often law firms are, are among them, obviously. But there are lots of companies that don't. We don't hear about them. We don't talk to them. You know, they don't talk to to me. They don't talk to me as a journalist because you know they don't care, care about being in the press and so on, uh, and they don't want to be in the press. And they also sometimes don't really care about this sort of stuff at all. There's a large, perhaps, uh, uh, group of cohort of, of companies that are in that camp. I don't, do, you, do you see that? Do you hear that? And how do you bring them along as well? Because unless, unless, unless things change you know, as a whole, it, it, having a small minority leading the way is, is great, but you need to bring the rest, don't you? No, it's a fair challenge. I think that um, all, all, all we can do is, is to 
um, is to point the way and then to encourage when people do take the move. I yeah, encourage people to make the move and then encourage them as they do. And often I think, I and mean, we've seen this around the UK, not only through this exercise and this work, but through other things we do, taking the first step is the most difficult. I mean, you know, we, we hear that in many different walks of life. The problem is, for many organisations, they are fearful from just taking that first step. They're firstly not sure what to do, so that might sound really stupid, but often they're not sure what to do. And they're so up against it, in, in their, uh, particularly right now in financial terms, they, they think, oh, doing something is going to cost them money. So this type of exercise and the promulgating it through you know, the way we can and, and hopefully across, across the UK with others, it, it gives people permission to take the risk to do something that is not only the right thing to do, but it's okay to do. And then that sounds really weird, but it's okay. You, you will make mistakes. We've made mistakes. You said you made mistakes. You know, everybody's going to make mistakes. But if you don't try, you won't get any progress. And all the data shows that when you do go down this route, genuinely with great advocacy from the top, you are become more profitable, more effective businesses. So like, get with the program, what's not to like? Mm. Virginia, just so before I come to the audience, I mean, to your thoughts on this and talking to your workforce and your staff, I mean, how, what, 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 what practical benefits have you seen from the, the stance you've taken? And give, and give some practical tips as well as, as a leader, <laughs> come on. What, what, are you, what, what would you um, advise if people came to you and said, like, we need some advice here? Uh, well, um, I, I think if you are a leader and you, you are not interested in this stuff, I wouldn't bother trying to lead going forward. Um, so I'd get off the pot and let someone else do it, I would say, um, because it is really important that we move the needle. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues tell us that purpose matters to them. Um, and being clear about culture and purpose and what our business is about has never been more important. They care about one another, and we need to show that we care too. Mm. So if you're not interested in this stuff, but you're all here today, so you are, um, but if you're not, and you're in a leadership role, then uh, step back. Um, I, I think if you, are, if you are at the start of your sort of, I don't like the phrase, the start of your journey, I'll say it because we all know what it means. But if you're, if you're at the start of it, um, I would applaud you and I would say, please have a go. Um, because if we reflect on what organizations, and we won't just talk about business, but what organizations did um, in the early part of 2020 and what happened and how we came through it, how we adjusted, how we adapted, we did all of those things, so we should take confidence in that. I know there is a risk at the moment with the difficulties that we face that we think we can sort of pop all of this in a cupboard and pretend we're going to read it in a few years' time or something. Um, but I would say we should have confidence. We should do it. We might get it wrong, but just try and keep going. If you've worked on your culture, People will understand if you get it a bit wrong. They won't forgive you forever. They do expect you to get it right. But they'll understand if you get it a little bit wrong. So I would encourage people to be courageous and to keep on with this. There are some practical things in here. It was at Lord Shinquin, right at the start, he said, you know, you went round the table with the commissioners and said, what do, you, what do you want out of this? And I said, I just want some practical things that people can do. Simple, practical steps that we can take together and that's what this is supposed to help with <laughs> absolutely fantastic right with that i will come do we have some questions from the floor there's, there's one there um there's one there as well uh and then i've got one as well written down so please sir. hi um Lizzie Penny, joint ceo of hoxby and co-author of work style um my questions for jonathan um, the IOD is obviously an institution that can inspire wholesale change in this area um, and for whom there are many influential members. What are the initiatives and internal groups and work streams that you have within the IOD now and will be setting up in the future that embody diversity, equity and inclusion? Um. We have a lot of internal uh, uh, um, groups, 
but when I say internal, I mean within the membership. So the way the IOD is structured is, you know, we happen to have a London hub here, and we have about 90 people, 89 people who work for the IOD. We're quite a small organization in that respect. Um, and, and within our own organization, we've taken a lot of steps to look at and, be, and listen to our, our colleagues about what they want from the organization in terms of being able to trust us, in terms of being able to, to look back at the organization and feel uh, they're able to talk about the issues they want to talk about and to be able to share. So there's, there's, there's that. Wider than that, we know we have you know, 20,000 members or thereabouts around the United Kingdom. So through each of the 53 different branches, we have been encouraged through the branch chairs and their volunteers, and there are some here today for which I'm incredibly grateful, to uh, have their own EDNI uh, teams. So that's a volunteer in each of the branches, and certainly at a regional level across all of our regions around the UK and the nations. Uh, we have people who um, who've taken it upon themselves to step forward and volunteer to lead on EDNI and the IOD from a volunteer perspective. That's a wonderful enabler. And, that, that, and what we're not doing is telling people what to do. What we are saying is here's a framework in which you can operate. Uh, and that allows people to be able to have the DNI events that we have going around the UK from uh, Highlands and Islands to Cornwall, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we also then have uh, a separate EDNI group that uh, uh, the person who was going to be sitting here, Roger Barker, Dr. Roger Barker, uh, uh, works on as well from uh, advising us and advising the board on, on our own EDNI. So I could go on at great length and we have glass ceiling groups, even as they're here. We have a whole bunch of groups around the UK to try to, uh, to step forward into society. And if you go back um, to a few years ago, just in one dimension, the IOD perception was seen as a male, pale, stale, London-centric organization. And you know, I mean, I can't help being male, pale, and stale, sorry, but, you know, um, but I'm from Yorkshire, so I'm not from London. And the whole approach that we've taken is to shift the balance to encourage a more open, more inclusive, um, more diverse organization that truly represents, as you were saying earlier, the, in this instance, the direct and equivalent of the United Kingdom. And we've shifted slowly but surely just on one dimension in terms of uh, the number of women now joining the IOD uh, is about a third. So about a third of our uh, uh, members, new members joining the idea are, are women. That's not good enough. I'd like to see far more. Um, but believe me, by comparison to when, when uh, a few years ago, when it was around 17%, uh, we're certainly seeing an improvement. And by just opening up the doors, literally, and saying we genuinely welcome across all um, uh, areas, all types, then that's been the, the most empowering thing. Uh, and it's challenged me as a leader, and I don't like what I hear sometimes about the way that we come across, but we have to take it on the chin and continue. So that's the answer. Uh, one more question there. Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Doe. I'm the Managing Director of APADA Business Psychology, and I'm also an IOD Ambassador for Inclusion. So that's one of the things that the IOD is doing to try and uh, raise the inclusion agenda. Um, putting my psychology hat on for a, a moment, I'm just aware of the, the, the bias that this, this room will have, that we tend to seek out things we agree with and avoid things that we don't. So I'm wondering what your tips might be for winning over those people who don't get it, will probably never get it, but who happen to be in a very influential position within your organisation. What I'm sure you've encountered at least one of those. I know I have several. What would your personal tips and memories be around that? Theresa, are you nodding away? OK, so, um, yeah, I should probably start by saying I've been a member of the IOD since I was 29, so I have a huge affection for the IOD. That was almost three decades ago, and I think it has changed. I think it's doing some great things. But like all institutions, you do come across people in, in every walk of life where they're just not getting it. And I think the thing that I would say as a woman first in my family to go to university, first woman to complete some IOD um, certifications in Scotland, you know, so, so really I think a bit of a trailblazer I would hope for other women. You have to just work really hard and work around people and don't try and move them because there's only so much energy you have for ED&I and for this work. There's only so much energy we have 
as individuals. So it's about not trying to change the unchangeable would be the first thing. The second thing would be coalesce around people who know this stuff and who get it right. So one of the things that I was really clear about when I've met some people who I've struggled with in terms of ethnic diversity, for example, is I pulled in people that I know who are really good in this field. So people like Nina Goswami, previously from the BBC, Judy, who you heard from earlier, um, Manish Joshi, who was in the front of the IOD magazine last year, and um, go to people who are really well respected in the particular part of EDI that you're trying to change. So ignore the unmovable and work around them. Don't waste your time, but coalesce and get a, a sort of collaboration with people that are well respected, that understand this stuff. And I'm not going to use the word lived experience because nobody says you have lived experience of going to a private school and going skiing in France, but you have lived experience of a disability. What I'm going to talk about are experts by experience. So coalesce around experts by experience and get them to help you move forward. Can I just add one thing, which will be uh, just to support you on that. So don't work with drains, work with radiators. Yeah. <laughs> drains are just a right pain in the arse, aren't they? Uh, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, you, there's only so many hours in a day. There's only so much energy you can, you can expend. Um, work around them. And also you will find that as you work around them, they will evaporate, to your point, because leaders who aren't on this Either they will self-select out, or they will be self they will be selected, be selected out. out. And you find that it's the colleagues around them that start going, uh, excuse me, um, I'm not sure if you're, if that's the right thing to say. So calling people out, but absolutely don't, just work with radiators. Um, drains are too draining to have, and they will be, they will evaporate in time. This was your point earlier, wasn't it, about you know, the step down? And yeah, and... Um I think I think the sort of drains and radiators. I was sort of well. I've been accused of being the queen of woke, um, and my response to that is actually that's about their resistance to change, and understanding why they are resistant to change, and there are fears involved in change. So spend some time trying to understand their fears about change. Um, but I was told, don't waste your energy on that. Go and focus your energy on the things you can do. Yeah. And um, it was so liberating, actually, in a way, when somebody said to me, you know, just stop fretting about that. Go around. And then, surprise, surprise, they sort of eventually, they turn around themselves, and suddenly you find that they've, they've come some distance with you. But it is not about everyone being the same. So... We've got to acknowledge that we should have appropriate challenge from people. It's not about suddenly everyone becoming, oh, yeah, this is all wokey. We could all become wokey people like I've been accused of being. So I think it is because there is a richness in the conversation of the challenge, and we shouldn't lose that in this discussion because it's complicated. George uh, Shinkwin, the, the House of Lords is... Not notorious for, uh, for having too many radiators in this sense, I, I suppose. I mean, do people, when you, uh, when, 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 you know, when you discuss this with your your colleagues there, it must be an uphill battle sometimes. So typically, I will make a speech in the um, House of Lords on EDI issues, and the minister will say from the dispatch box how moved they were uh, without moving one inch. In policy. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right, Dan. Um, the one point addressing the, the question that was just asked, though, in terms of I totally agree with the uh, drains versus radiators and the way you put your energy, um, although unfortunately I'd hate to say where most of my colleagues would sit uh, on that spectrum, um, and I, I probably still have to talk to them. So. Um, but um, I'd also draw your attention to a, a fantastic statistic in the white paper. Um, so an organisation called Talent LMS um, produced some research this year showing that 77% of Generation Zers, i.e. born after 97, value companies on the basis of their EDI commitments. So actually, um, 
even someone who is a very blocked up train should be open to pick up the point that uh, Jonathan and others made the openness point should be open to that fact that they won't attract talent even if they're averse to attracting diverse talent, they won't attract, attract any particularly good talent from Generation Z unless um, they resonate with that generation's values. Yeah, absolutely. It's we certainly find that at the Financial Times as well. It's, uh, and to, to a degree, maybe that's why government doesn't need to necessarily take a role, because business should be pushing this, because they, they know their workforces need require this of, the, of them as, 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 as business leaders. Um, so I, I've, I mean, I, I'll ask you a question which is going to lead, we got a question which was uh, uh, given to us uh, earlier um, and I'll bring, I'll come, I'll come to it, but first of all, I'll start off by just sort of setting the scene slightly by saying, uh, you know, we're talking about lots of different things here, right? We're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about gender, disability, both what, uh, disability you can see and disability you can't see. And, it, and do you think companies, and it's a general question to everyone, do you think companies tackle all these different areas and approach these different areas equally as well? And, and if not, what is, what, what is suffering here? I mean, uh, I, 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 I say this knowing, uh, you know, to some extent, um, uh, I interviewed the, uh, the, uh, one, the, one of your former colleagues, uh, Charlotte. Uh, Villa, who's you know, uh, who runs, uh, is very, uh, uh, you know, she's autistic and she's on the spectrum and uh, and she's you know she's campaigning a lot around this subject and she only discovered she was autistic in the 40s and so on. Anyway, th you know, her point is very much that you know this is this is one thing that companies don't see, for example, so they find it very difficult to to deal with. And that's just one example. And so I'd like to know your views on this before we we, uh, we come to my other question. So, I mean, I, I obviously know Charlotte quite well. And um, she, she stepped out and spoke up. And I think that, um, that, that that has to be applauded. And I think that's where leaders can make a big difference. Uh, and uh, you know, she, was, she was, and continues to be very honest about the fact that you know, not everybody listens to her. And I think having uh, role models, having people like Charlotte speak up about the issues, it, it raises it and raises it and raises it. And the volume goes up and goes up. And as a result, People, even the drains, kind of start to listen. It is such a complicated problem uh, issue, and you, you, you alluded to this earlier. Um, but you've got to start somewhere. So whether it be neurodiversity or race or gender equality or whatever, you know, start somewhere, and and you will get pilloried for not starting where the person wanted you to start. Uh, and but that's kind of like that's life. That's about being a leader. And I was once told by um, in fact, a board member. I won't say which board member of the, of the IOD, but board member of the IOD. Um, said, um, you've got to remember, John, that nobody likes change. That, well, yeah. So, but 50% of the people you're working with don't like change. And the other 50% don't like the change you're trying to do. <laughs> so, just get on and make the change. <laughs> Uh, because otherwise you are not the leader that you're supposed to be. You have to go out on a limb. You have to say stuff. You have to be wrong, and it's okay being wrong, and then be called on it, and you know, I get called on it every week. And, and it, I think it's important, therefore, you just have that solidity and, and resilience to hold on to what is the right thing, because it is the right thing to do, and you know it's the right thing to do, and in your heart you know it's the right thing to do. Do it. So I'm probably a little bit biased because of my day job and I think the area in terms of EDI that we don't do enough work on is learning disability specifically and um, that's just not my opinion that's the data that tells us so the biggest employability gap in our country today is learning disability 70% of people with a learning disability want to work in England that's 5% in Scotland it's 7% we're only marginally better and um, however what we need to do is close that gap. And if we don't close that gap, then yes, we are um, depriving ourselves in terms of labour market shortages, but more importantly, we're depriving ourselves of creativity. And I think that's to the point around neurodiversity. EY have opened up their second centre for excellence um, globally just this week in Glasgow. So they see that as a really fertile environment because we have strong advocates, strong campaigning, strong links with government in terms of changing policy, which I think sometimes actually might be slightly easier in a Scottish context, in a UK context. 
What we're seeing is big businesses understanding the need to be better at this stuff, but that disability employment gap is huge, and that will take a concerted effort to change. And I think that's where all of our shoulders should be to the wheel in trying to change that now. Yeah, it feels like the last uh, uh, 10, 12 years, and partly because of the work of the Hampton Alexander and the 30% Club, you know, uh, there's been there's been strides made in, in gender. Uh, to some, to some degree, it's not by far from parity, obviously, you know, and that's what you're aiming for, but it's getting better. But there are other areas which don't feel as quite, as progressed quite as fast, I think. Uh, I mean, Virginia, would you agree with this? I mean, I, I... Yes, I would agree. Yeah. Um, and disability is, is the one. Mm. Uh, if I look at our organisation, our, um, if we look at our, our networks, if we look at our data, disability is... A, a neglected area. It's got focus now. It's got exec sponsorships. So our exec board has a, you know, we have a sponsor who is supporting the work that we want to do. Do we have a network of colleagues, who, uh, you know, a group of colleagues who've come forward and said we'd like to form a network? Not yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite telling. Uh -huh. So the, our, our colleagues with disabilities, many of which are hidden disabilities, are, I think, still feeling their way into coming forward. And we will not be attracting talent in until we can talk about the talent that we have. And, and that's, so that's the one for us. That's a big area of focus for us now. So when I first met Virginia several years ago, one of the points that she made to me was that um, the imagery, and again, this is uh, a recommendation uh, that we've included in the white paper. The imagery used on uh, all your communications, so the website, uh, social media, um, can promote your values, probably already do promote your values, including EDI. Um, and for me, one of the most exciting and positive aspects, and there are many um, downsides that have been highlighted today in terms of the disability employment gap, for example, but also the challenges uh, with regards to other protected uh, characteristics. Um, but the most exciting thing is that there is a real opportunity here, particularly given the statistic I mentioned earlier of 77% of Generation Z is saying they really value EDI in employers, to say, OK, we're going to use it as a way of promoting our firm. So it's essentially about classic commercial competition. Uh, there's a real market opportunity there. And so I'm hoping that in addition to all the fantastic work, that IOD are doing, and I'd like to just take the opportunity to draw your attention to the wonderful work that the author of this white paper, Alex Hall Chen, has done in condensing the thoughts uh, and suggestions of uh, the members of the commission. So thank you, Alex. Um, one of the most exciting things is that it needn't cost money to really make progress and build on uh, the work of Alex, her team, and the IOD, and to make these recommendations a reality, particularly with regards to the point that Matthew Layton was making earlier, culture. What's a culture that you're communicating? That needn't cost an awful lot of investment. And indeed, one final point, if you look at the 19 excellent recommendations on pages six and seven of the white paper, not one of them begins with the word invest or spend money. It's all about reviewing. It's about assessing your baseline. It's about ensuring transparency. There is not a big price tag. Fantastic. I, I'm gonna, we're, we're, we're rapidly coming up to, to the end of, of our sessions now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to, to somewhat conclude by asking each of you if you had to choose one recommendation or one bit of advice that you could provide from the report, if 
if you if you can if you if you can that'd be, that'd be fantastic. But if there's something which you want to bring together so, uh, several things into one element, what would you what would you tell the people uh, you know watching us? What would you tell companies? Hopefully, that will be fed around as well. What do you tell companies to do, Teresa? Um, so I think that's quite simple for me. It's about data, data, and data. It's collecting the data, not just the mandatory data, but the data that will improve your business or your organisation. One of the things I think is really important, and, I, and it made me stop to think, was hearing someone talk about performative allyship. So don't just say what you're going to do actually collect the data and then evidence what you have done. And if it takes you five years or 10 years or 15 years, that really isn't the essence of the problem. It's the authenticity by which you go on the journey. So for me, it's simple, it would be the data. Yeah, we'll have the data. Uh, and to test you on your, your, your recommendations, <laughs> <laughs> well, Shingman, um, I, you just, uh, just uh, boned up a little bit there. You can see just he was looking at the uh, his notes. Uh, have you been <laughs> cheating? <laughs> yeah. I'm just cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking or am I talking? You're Who's talking, talking? Sorry. Am I talking? Um, well, I would, um, it might not surprise you, I, I would attend to the culture and I would really understand what your culture is um, because if you're going to collect the data, you need the culture that enables people to feel safe. And then having collected the data, I would absolutely agree. You have to show what you have done with it and what you are going to do because our colleagues tell me that we're really pleased when the business listens to what they have to say and then acts upon it because you will shatter the trust and the culture, I have talked to our colleagues about presiding over shattered dreams because unless you have the culture right, you can bring in a diverse workforce, but if the culture is not right, they will not thrive. So we will not preside over shattered dreams because we will get that culture where it needs to be so that it can support them. Um, I was uh, cheating. I was looking at the recommendations because I was going to say data, data, data. <laughs> um, um, but I, I do think drawing on, on both Teresa's and Virginia's important points takes me back to the point that Matthew and others have said throughout the day, which is the vital importance of leadership, of uh, buying in setting that tone from the top. And also, uh, one of the points I think Virginia made earlier, which is living it, and living it as a leader. And um, i just say a huge thanks, because as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, I have been supported uh, terrifically by leaders who take ED&I so seriously. Fantastic, and uh, from our host, Jonathan. I think the thing, I mean, I could say, um, you know, all of the recommendations are fairly, um, are, are very helpful. And you've got to pick your own poison. So I would, I would go you know, do something. Um, and f kind of speaking personally from the IOD, you know, um, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, I talk a lot about being authentic. Um, and, you know, what you see is what you get uh, with me and uh, hopefully colleagues see that. So we are... We try to, yeah, we celebrate success, but we also sort of have to acknowledge the failure um, and fess up when we get it wrong, um, and we do get it wrong. And I think that hopefully if, if colleagues recognize that, you know, we are trying, um, are very trying sometimes, uh, and, and we're doing it be not because we think it's the right thing, but because we just feel we should. I mean, that's an, I don't know if I can express that any other way. It just feels from the inside that this is, this is too important not to do. And you'll find across the board of the IOD and the council uh, of, of the IOD uh, and the executive um, the same kind of real focus of attention on it, uh, accepting we're going to get some of this stuff wrong, but we're going to keep going. So important. I, I, I mean, I, I hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. I've taken stacks of notes because um, it's been, you know, been so valuable hearing all these different you know, advice, uh, thoughts, uh, you know, the, the leadership on the, on the panel alone is, is fantastic. So thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Um, we, there are drinks uh, after, uh, after this finishes downstairs, I believe. Is that correct? I, I, I think there's a bar, I think. But I'm not buying drinks right it's now. Actually on, <laughs> it's actually on this floor. It's actually on this floor. There's also yeah. a bar downstairs, but even later, though. Um, so uh, just something to bear in mind, anyway. I, uh, but thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to, I'm gonna, uh, and as, as a couple of my panelists are going to, we're going to come off and we're going to leave Lord Shinquin and Jonathan to finish off. But thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
I think it's, well, it's really easy to, to finish off because it's just to say thank you. <laughs> that, but kind of say thank you in maybe a, um, a, a slightly different way. Uh, in that, of course, the IUD happens to have been the convener of this. But that's all we've done. We've convened. I mean, we hope that we as an organization can step out and, and stand up and talk about this in a very um, authentic and inclusive way. Uh, but, but all we've been is the enablers. You know, the, the commissioners have done an enormous amount of work. And I would again pull, pay tribute, as, as Lord Shinkman has done, to the author, uh, Alex, um, who has worked incredibly hard uh, to be authentic and give the right um, information in a very balanced, I think, way, and very well-written way. So I would just celebrate um, Alex's <laughs> And, and as I say, uh, it would be great to see people next door. Uh, and obviously, if you'd like to spend money downstairs in the champagne bar, I'll, I'll be very happy to take that as well. Uh, but just to say thank you very much for coming. And for those colleagues who have been watching online, thank you for um, staying with us. Uh, and also, if you could um, talk about this, please use, use LinkedIn, please use Twitter, please talk about it, because unless we share um, then the few voices in this room will only be a few voices. So can I really encourage you, good and bad, but hopefully good, uh, talk about this, uh, and promulgate the report, uh, look out for the white paper, um, and help us to be uh, talking about this in a much more successful and inclusive way. But I'll leave the final word to Lord Shinkwin. Thank you. to add my thanks uh, to all of you. It's so good to look um, around and see the room still so full. Uh, I'd uh, particularly like to thank Dan Thomas for being a superb Tom Pair. Uh, so thank you, Dan. And um, just all of the commissioners uh, for joining me on what has been a very productive and exciting uh, journey. And this is only the end of the beginning. Um, and a huge thanks to the IOD for being the catalyst um, and for providing a springboard, um, which I'm, I'm sure will uh, bear fruit uh, over the years to come. So thank you very much. <laughs>